Over the past 30 plus years, Joel and Ethan Cohen have become one of the most prominent filmmaking duos in the history of cinema. While it's all but impossible to find a genuine black mark among their work, Cohen Brothers movies are not all created equal. While the Cohen Brothers remake of the 1955 Brit crime flick is often gorgeous to look at, nothing else really works in The Lady Killers. The comedy falls flat, the moral quandaries are simplistic at best and pandering at worst. Tom Hanks' turn as a would-be Southern gentleman is particularly distracting. Now I want to know what's going on. Oh, indeed, indeed. The thirst for knowledge is a very commendable thing. There's not much to say about The Lady Killers except that it's a rare, genuine misfire for the talented duo. For those who don't recall this occasionally hilarious crime picture, Intolerable Cruelty stars George Clooney as a divorce lawyer and Catherine Zeta-Jones as a gold digger about to dupe a billionaire oil baron. Sadly, despite palpable chemistry between Clooney and Zeta-Jones, the film misses the mark. Still, Intolerable Cruelty does feature one of George Clooney's all-time greatest line readings. You fascinate me. Ultimately, the film is bogged down by labored plotting, thinly drawn side characters, and a third act that twists one too many times for the film to rank among the Coen's best. Set on the back lots of a film studio in the 1950s, Hail Caesar saw the Coens making a Hollywood fable about the studio system of old. Told through the eyes of a studio fixer, the movie dabbles in just about every film genre you can imagine, from crime to farce and back again. Unfortunately, there's just a bit too much going on for any one storyline to resonate. That ultimately leaves Hail Caesar one of the brothers' weaker works, although that still makes it better than most movies that get released. Would the would the detours the same? Would the detours the same? Would the detours the same? Would the detours Would the detours the same? Rufal, rufal, rufal. Burn After Reading features a screenplay that somehow ranks among both the darkest and funniest the Coens have ever written, not to mention stellar performances from George Clooney, Francis McDormand, John Malkovich, Tilda Swinton, and a marvelously over the top Brad Pitt. The guy? The guy, the secret guy. So is he high up? Uh, I don't know if he's high. Probably. To be honest, if Burn After Reading had been released anywhere else in the Coen's filmography, it would likely rank higher on this list. Unfortunately, the film was released a year after No Country for Old Men. And while Burn is occasionally brilliant, it still comes across a bit shallow in the shadow of such lofty fare. With its hard-to-love characters, its dialogue that verges on annoying, its absurdist plot, and the twist of the fantastical that never quite feels natural, The Hudsucker Proxy is undoubtedly one of the most maligned and forgotten films in the brothers' filmography. That's a shame, because a closer look reveals well-drawn characters, a giddily ridiculous plot, and clever, fast-paced dialogue. Hiya, Chief. Just the person I wanted to apologize to. About seven minutes. Yeah, I was all wet about your idea, man. Well, thanks for being so generous. In short, The Hudsucker Proxy might be the most misunderstood and underrated films the Coens have made to date. It took some serious confidence to tackle a remake of True Grit, a film held in high esteem by film fans and novices alike. The Coens wisely didn't try to reinvent the wheel, allowing the Western narrative to unfold in pretty much the same fashion as the original. Of course, they also dressed the story up with their own narrative and stylistic flourishes, and pulled brilliant performances from Jeff Bridges, Matt Damon, and their newcomer, Haley Steinfeld. Altogether, they just didn't make a great remake of a classic film. They made one of the best remakes of all time. If The Hudsucker Proxy is the most misunderstood film in the Coen's body of work, it's only because The Man Who Wasn't There is a film all but beyond rational comprehension. Billy Bob Thornton plays a dispirited, sub-verbose barber who thinks his ship has come in when a stranger offers a chance to invest in a new fad called dry cleaning. Me, I don't talk much. I just cut the hair. From that unusual setup, the brothers spin one of the weirdest stories they've ever concocted, and deliver a wholly original neo-noir thriller fit for the modern age. It's an utterly unique film, even for the idiosyncratic filmmakers. If their staggering body of work has taught us anything, it's that the Coen brothers have no shortage of original stories to tell. For proof, look no further than The Ballad of Buster Scruggs, a sprawling Western anthology film composed of six disparate stories of the West. Some are funny, others dramatic, and a couple are downright heartbreaking. In true Coen fashion, those elements are often at play within the same story, making The Ballad of Buster Scruggs a giddy and galvanizing cinematic experience, even if it isn't quite coherent enough to rank among their very best. 
first. We all love hearing about ourselves, so long as the people in the stories are us, but not us. Not us in the end, especially. Set in a bustling, prohibition-era metropolis, Miller's Crossing follows the chief advisor of a mob kingpin as they try to navigate the shifting tides but particularly nasty turf war. Of those tides, we'll say that they never lead quite where you'd expect, that the stakes are high and that saying any more would spoil the fun of watching the film. What we can say is that of the Coen's produced writing credits, Miller's Crossing undeniably stands as some of their finest work. It's a harrowing, mistaken identity crime thriller about an average dude trying to replace his rug. It's a campy comedy classic about a fish out of water who gets in way over his head in the seedy underground of the San Fernando Valley. It's a character study about an aging stoner whose ambition in life is to smoke, drink white Russians, and occasionally hit the bowling alley for league play. It's also one of the greatest cult films ever made and one of the most quotable scripts ever produced. Look, there's really not that much we can say about The Big Lebowski that hasn't been said already. You either abide the Big Lebowski as the masterfully envisioned madcap stoner epic masterpiece that it is, or, well, you're just wrong. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like, uh, your opinion, man. Like crime and criminals, religion has often found its way into the Coen's films. In their caustic farce, A Serious Man, the brothers deliver a complicated religious parable about a Jewish psychics professor searching for meaning as his life falls apart around him. Watching a man's entire life crumble hardly sounds like the formula for great comedy. But even in the film's heaviest moments, the Coens add just enough levity to keep it from becoming a blunt trauma sort of drama. If you grew up in the Jewish faith, the film, with its winking in jokes and scores of Judaic details, will hit extreme close to home. Oh Brother, Where Art Thou is a Depression-era tale about penniless escaped convicts perilously traversing the American South in search of a fabled treasure. The Coens claim Homer's epic poem, The Odyssey, as a film source material, though they also claim to have never read the poem itself. That's okay, because the batty, beautiful, alternate musical they crafted is a timeless, hilarious Southern Fried epic in its own right. It finally brought the Coens off-kilter sensibilities to the mainstream, and its bluegrassy soundtrack became a legit cultural phenomenon. On. A tragic tale of a kidnapping scheme gone unimaginably wrong against the icy backdrops of North Dakota and Minnesota, Fargo features everything you could possibly want from a Coen Brothers film. Don't argue with us. I'm not, uh, I I'm not arguing here. I'm cooperating. And there's no we're doing all we can. While Fargo is one of the Coen's more serious cinematic ventures, it still features their signature dark humor, vibrant language, colorful characters, and of course, brutal outbursts of violence. It all comes together to make Fargo one of the most uniquely Coen-esque movies ever made. Set against the barren, dusty vistas of a desolate desert town, Raising Arizona tells the story of a couple who, in the face of fertility troubles, decide to kidnap a baby. Raising Arizona only gets crazier as that improbable narrative unfolds, which maybe raises a few questions. Is Raising Arizona a comedy of errors about lovable kidnappers? Yes. Is it a Reagan-era parable about trickle-down economics and the prison reform gone haywire? Seems like it. Is Raising Arizona a radically idealistic farce that heralded the arrival of a bold new cinematic vision? 100%. It's crazy in all the best ways, and if you don't believe that, you simply cannot call yourself a Coen Brothers fan. As the story goes, while the brothers were writing Miller's Crossing, they hit a creative wall so fierce they put the project on hold. In hopes of kickstarting their creative juices, they conceptualized a new film centered around a character created specifically for John Turturro. From the creative void of writer's block, Barton Fink, a wildly original, scathingly satirical, pseudo-mystical masterpiece was born. A masterpiece about, of all things, a writer facing a devastating creative block. Not to mention a full-fledged metaphysical crisis of identity that may or may not directly involve the devil. Simply put, Barton Fink is a haunting look at the life of the creative mind, the likes of which moviegoers had never seen before, and possibly even since. Lewin Davis is manipulative and self-centered, but he's also an intensely likable guy who usually tries to do the right thing. That messy texture is what makes inside Lewin Davis such a fascinating experiment in character. I have the money, don't worry. With you, I worry. Well, you shouldn't. Yes, I should. God knows you never do. It helps that the character is played with equal parts charm, swagger, and crippling insecurity by Oscar Isaac in a star-making turn. Watching Isaac portray such an identifiable, beautifully flawed character is enough to make Inside Lewin Davis worth a look. That the music, the settings, and the supporting characters are crafted with equal skill and care, and that's what makes Inside Lewin Davis one of the Coen's most memorable works to date. 
While it's hard to believe that the Coens made their feature debut over 30 years ago, it's harder still to believe just how much they got right with that debut film. Make no mistake, Blood Simple is still every bit the biting, brutal, exactingly scripted, and exquisitely photographed noir-soaked thriller it was upon its release. Its menacing, white-knuckle finale will leave your palm sweaty as it unfolds before your eyes. Blood Simple is one of the most staggeringly assured debut films ever produced, and it remains one of the Coen brothers' best, period. Written by legendary scribe Cormac McCarthy, and possessed of stark western themes and bracing wits, No Country for Old Men seemed tailor-made for the Coens' peculiar sensibilities. Sensibilities aside, the Coens took the bones of McCarthy's novel and ran with them, delivering a high-minded art film dressed up as one of the greatest crime-chase thrillers cinema has ever seen. Along the way, they poured startlingly sparse performances from Tommy Lee Jones and Josh Brolin, and an iconically villainous turn from Javier Bardem. In short, No Country Country stands as the crowning achievement of Joel and Ethan Cohen's career in film. Is something wrong? With what? With anything. Is that what you're asking me? Is there something wrong with anything? Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite movies are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.